Can I just introduce you? Yep. You want to appear like behind the podium? No. Hi, you guys. Thanks for coming. Uh, on behalf of Scott Goldstein, captain of Pikesville Volunteer Fire Company, I thank you so much for joining us in our new training space. Uh, thanks for taking the time out of your day. My name's Sean Barinholtz. I'm a volunteer member here. I'm also an anesthesiologist and a critical care physician at Hopkins, and I serve on the medical board for the Baltimore County Fire Department. So I've been working with Andy Pollack, Dave Wittberg, Jeff Sagel, all of our medical directors and fire surgeons to try to offer a little bit more opportunities for education uh, for our EMS community and opportunities to just better connect uh, and to learn from each other and to continue our quest for lifelong learning. So again, thanks for uh, joining us. We are approved for two MIMS CEUs, so if you could sign in, that's great. I have signing sheets if we could circulate them around. I am asking, make sure you try to put your MIMS number on there. It just makes it easier for me to find you in the MIMS system. Uh, if, if you want uh, credit, that would be amazing. So your, your station and your MIMS number. If anyone has any other suggestions on speakers, please feel free to let me know. I think that we're booked right now through May or June, I think, um, off of speakers that I know. Um, uh, several of you have given me other recommendations, and, and I'm happy to follow up on, on any, anybody who you think would be uh, a good addition uh, for this kind of a speaking series. Uh, anything that you guys want to know about, or if you have a topic in mind and you don't have a speaker, let me know. Maybe I can try to find a speaker for that. Um, so... Whatever you guys think best, this is really meant for you. Um. This series is meant for you uh, and to support the important work that you guys do in the field every day. So thanks again. Uh, today is Dennis Krebs, Surviving When Violence Erupts. Dennis is a retired captain and paramedic with Baltimore County Fire Department. Following 30 years in the fire service, he worked as a tactical medic, supporting various federal law enforcement uh, special operations team. He's currently a government contractor, uh, teaching tactical combat casualty care, as well as other specialized training for various government assets. I also know that he's an author, and I think you just published your third book. So you can't keep track. Is that what it is? Yeah, all the money. Right. And I... <laughs> And I've also learned not to ask him specifically about what he does because he won't talk about it. Thanks, Dennis. Thanks. Thank you. Um, get this all squared away. So thanks, everybody, for coming out um, tonight. Um, certainly appreciate the, the large crowd. And hopefully I'll be able to impart some halfway decent information that keeps your rear ends out of a bind. Um, a little bit more about me. I spent five years in the city fire department, spent 25 out here before I retired. Um, back in about 1992, started teaching for a DOD program, Department of Defense program that was teaching medics assigned to SWAT teams, and then became one of their decentralized uh, medics and would travel here, there, stand in front of the White House and all that kind of stuff for them. Um, and then worked with Johns Hopkins doing the same thing. Uh, we had missions all throughout the country. Uh, that we would go to for raids with ATF or marshals or other folks. Um, I've done some teaching for the military up at Fort Dix and down in Virginia Beach and the other things that we we do right now um, are mainly around the, the DC area although we have done some stuff out in LA and, and other places. So what I'm going to talk about tonight is you all staying out of trouble. Um, this whole program come to fruition back in 1982. Uh, I was a firefighter at Station 1 in Towson and was assigned to the Medic 1 for the day. About 7 a.m. in the morning, we got a call from a man slumped over the steering wheel. And myself and the other guy on the Medic unit for the day pulled up, not knowing any better. We just go walking up to the side of the car. There's an odor of alcohol coming out of the window. Hey, buddy, what's the problem? And I reached through the window, shook him, 
and the guy produced a 357 and nearly shot me in the face. The only thing that saved my rear end that day was that there was a state trooper coming up the other side of the car and he dove through the window and grabbed the guy's arm. And it was just the fact that I, although I had, from being in the city, we had violence all the time, um, but hadn't been in any of that type of situation, hadn't been trained on what to do and what not to do. Um, a close friend of mine, Mark Gabriel with the Maryland State Police, he was in aviation uh, and a volunteer down at Rosedale, had talked about the fact that they had just gone through, and this was in 1982, they had just gone through police officer survival training. So we got to talking, I got permission, went through the same training that he had, go had gone through. And we sat down and took the, the tactics that a police officer utilizes, more rearranged them to meet the needs of what we do. And we started doing that here, and it grew very, rather quickly, and we started teaching this program throughout the United States. And changed a lot of minds, um, and we still would have people, and I can vividly remember a, a lady from Reicherstown in one of the original classes sitting in the front row and just shaking her head like this, and said, well, you're shaking your head, why? My job's to treat people. Whether knives are being thrown, bullets are flying, my job's to treat people. And, you know, that attitude has shifted a good bit, um, but we still have a certain level of, of attitude that, that we still deal with. And, and I'm going to talk about incidents, and I'm not picking on individuals at any point in time, okay? But um, I hear it all the time of, well, if somebody gives me a hard time, I'll crack them across the head with a D-cylinder, with the oxygen bottle. That doesn't work, all right? you're going to wind up in a set of handcuffs real quick. And it's going to be on videotape. You all know that everybody has a camera. And every time you go out, I can guarantee you there's somebody taking your picture. You might not know it. You might not see it. But I guarantee you, you crack somebody across the head with an oxygen cylinder, it's going to be on the nightly news somewhere. You're going to hear about it. And as opposed to getting into trouble and trying to fight your way out, identify it identify the potential that something's going to go wrong and stay away from it. Walk away from it. You know, as opposed to being in the back of the ambulance and having the need, you know, this guy's starting to, to fight. Holler at the driver, pull the thing over, put it in park and get out. Do I care if they tear up the back of 325 or 315 or 465? I don't care. Let them do it. They're not tearing me up. Right? So the objective of all of this, that's the only objective. At the end of your tour, you go home. Ten fingers, ten toes. No leaks. Right? Real simple. So a lot of the information I have, I'm going to go through real fast because this program was originally like eight hours long. So I don't have the ability to do eight hours in two. So I'm going to talk fast. If you have a question, scream it out. But you're going to see a lot of things over, over a short period of time. All right, some of the things that, that we'll try to cover, what to do if you have somebody that is armed, walking up to a residence, dealing with, with residential incidents, wh which we most frequently do, domestic situations, what's going to stop a bullet and what's not, how to get away from an armed encounter and different types of weapons that you may not realize can be used against you, right? So, uh, that was a quick overview. This is awareness, right? We aren't going to get into how to break elbows. If you came to, to the class tonight thinking that I'm going to teach how to, you know, snap elbows and crack people in the head, you got the wrong idea. One of the biggest things that you can do, not only when you're on a medic unit or on a fire engine, but in your own personal life, keep your head on a swivel, and, and you hear that all the time. But be aware of what's going on around you. A lot of us have the tendency to, to be on our phone, and, and I mean, you, I work in D.C. on a routine basis, and you'll see people walking down the street, and they walk into the crosswalk and never even look because they're sitting on their phone. Because of the amount of training and other things that I've done and, and been through, I am always aware of things that are going on around me. If, if, and my wife knows it, 
we go into a restaurant, I sit down, I have my eye on the door. When I go to church, I sit in the last pew, and if I hear the door open up behind me, I look. And, and that's just from habit. Call me paranoid, but it's habit that I understand what's going on around me. And an example, um, earlier last year, I was on the metro down in D.C. on the red line, Chinatown station. And I come down, I got a backpack, and I'm standing there, there's a, an elderly lady sitting on the, the concrete bench a couple of feet away, and she's got a cane, and there's a, a guy standing pretty close to, to her, and my head is just every couple of seconds moving back and forth, just watching what's going on around me. My back is up against the concrete barrier, nobody behind me, and my head goes this way, and at one point my head comes back, and the guy that was over near her is now within six inches of me, and he goes like this and walks on by. And the guy was going to try to grab the backpack. And if I wouldn't have had my head moving back and forth and had my, excuse me, head out of my ass, I'd have had been mugged and the backpack would have been gone. Right? So even in your personal life, watch what's going on around you. Even on medical calls, watch what's going on around you. I've had a number of times that people have, during classes have come up and said, we were so focused on patient care and all of a sudden I wind up feeling a cold something at my neck and lo and behold it's a knucklehead with a gun and we just weren't paying attention right there are no guarantees in any of this right there are police officers that are very well trained that go out and have body armor on and Jason Schneider was one of them and I had done stuff with Jason when I was helping the county SWAT team and very well trained, very well armed, had body armor on, and things went wrong, right? So you can do all this stuff and you can still wind up being hurt, but it reduces the, the probability of you being hurt if you just follow some simple things and watch what's going on around you, right? I take, uh, I'm very passionate about this. Um, I've been doing it for so many years, uh, so, you know, I get riled up at times, so, excuse me. So this was an incident out in San Diego, right? Sheriff's deputies go to serve a warrant. A uh, guy comes to the door with a gun, shoots the sheriff's deputy, barricade situation ensues. SWAT team on the scene. The guy comes out of the house. He's promptly taken care of by the SWAT team. And what happens? Does this guy belong here? Yet we still put firefighters and paramedics on the scene of, of hostage incidents and barricades on a routine basis, yet how much training have you had on what exactly should you be doing while you're sitting there, right? We routinely put people in these situations. Now the county police, and I screamed and yelled for probably 10, 15 years about having, having somebody assigned to the, to the SWAT team, and the fire department wouldn't do it, they've currently got medics. So that re reduces us back to a warm zone area, but we still wind up on those scenes without any clue of what to do. Right? A lot of people have said in the past, well, you know, our body armor is made out of Kevlar at that time. Doesn't that make this shit bulletproof? Uh, no, it doesn't. So I'm going to go through a number of things, and you'll see that these, these things go on. You know, another incident, you got guys here in bunker gear, one police officer with a shotgun, another with a handgun. New Orleans years ago, and some of the older guys in the room will remember the bumblebee helmets that you see on the, the guys from New Orleans. Um, this was a very well-known incident down in New Orleans. Uh, a police lieutenant and um, a cadet were shot and killed one night behind the, the downtown police station. Uh, the guy that did it went into hiding the following day, comes out, goes into the downtown Howard Johnson's hotel, starts indiscriminately shooting people and lights the building on fire. When the fire department arrives on the scene, they have heavy fire showing from the upper floors of the hotel. Start up the ladder, start up the stairs, they exit onto the fire floor, boom, 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 firefighters being shot. The guy lying here was on the tip of the area ladder when he was shot. Right? So it's not only just riding the medic unit, I've got more pictures and incidents of, of guys being, being on fire trucks and being shot at than I do from, from EMS. Right? L.A., 
during the riots in 92, 93. Um, I had the opportunity to go out and spend a week with LA City Fire Department right after the, the riots um, and spent a week with them going over what worked and what didn't work for the, for the riots. What I did not know going in there was that every single fire engine, ladder truck, medic unit, battalion chief's car had body armor assigned to it. And this was going back a number of years because of their gang problem. So if they would get a call for a shooting, a stabbing, an assault, anything, they would get on the engine, the ladder truck, the battalion chief's car, whatever, behind their seat was their body armor. Put their body armor on and they all wear white or lightweight brush fire jackets. And they would put the brush fire jacket on over top of it to conceal the body armor. All these guys here are wearing body armor. That's what the captain's wearing there. Underneath their bunker gear and their breathing apparatus was body armor. The tiller trucks, uh, I became close friends with, with one of the guys out there, uh, Battalion Chief Terry Manning. And he, he was one of the first battalion chiefs and the incident commander initially down in South Central. And he told me that their tiller trucks at that point in time were not enclosed. The rear tillerman was not enclosed in a, in a cab. So he was outside. LA weather's pretty nice. During the riots, these guys were wearing body armor around their upper torso. They took another set of body armor and wrapped around their legs, had one hand on the steering wheel, and they carried trash can lids and were fending off rocks and bottles with trash can lids as they were driving the rear end of the ladder truck. And as soon as he saw that they were doing that, he pulled all the ladder trucks off the street. This was just last year. I was in LA and um, during mass casualty shooting at USC. All these guys here, those are fire department personnel in body armor and helmets. Just had a shooting last week in Kentucky, a school shooting. And if you watch the news coverage, the sheriff said, thank God last year we had active shooter training with all of our schools. And I wasn't in a position that I wanted to say that in this little town in Kentucky that it would never happen here, right? Because it can happen anywhere. And, you know, we haven't learned that lesson yet to be able to put together any type of a policy or procedure for us on what we're going to do when that ha happens. You know, in uh, Perry Hall, and nearly had an incident up in Owings Mills a, a couple months back. Memphis had a fire call, two firefighters shot, one sheriff's deputy shot to death. This was a study that was done a number of years ago. Some sort of violence occurred in nearly 10% of patient encounters across the, the realm within EMS. 96% of, in, in this study, 96% of the EMS providers in the study had been assaulted. 24% of the, the jurisdictions had personnel that had been shot. Right. Webster, New York, two firefighters shot. They were ambushed as they pulled up on the scene. House fire. The number stopped doing this because they got to be so many. But if you get firehouse.com or some of the other uh, emails that come out, you can look. And it's almost on a weekly basis that, you know, somebody's being stabbed, somebody's being shot, somebody's being assaulted. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. Last year, they had the, the EMS uh, providers down in the city, the two females at the hospital that got the daylight beat out of them by somebody that was just mentally off balance. I mean, and, and it just, it continues. Right. So, please don't think that it's not going to happen to you. Right? It can. 2016, PG Fire Department responds for a welfare check. And they get on the scene, walk up to the door, and the guy opens fire. Kills Alm Schneider, shoots the other the other individual, right, two firefighters shot, one of them dies, right? And, and the sad thing is, I had offered to go down and, and do a class for PG County. Started out doing, we were going to do four classes, and 
because of a lack of interest, it got cut to two. So the day that I went down there, I had an afternoon class and an evening class. You know how many people I had show up? Now, this is after two guys had been shot, one was dead within weeks. I had 19 people show up out of PG County. Right? And, and everybody thinks, well, it's not gonna happen to me. You know, it can. So. This nigga out here biting at the police on Dunder Avenue. This nigga just get off the fucking bus, yo. He's biting at the police. Dunder Avenue. Jesus, this nigga. You're on medic six. Maybe you're not dispatched to that. There was an officer shot, but maybe you're dispatched to something else and your route of travel is taking you down to, uh, down Dundalk Avenue. And all of a sudden, you're a block away and you're starting to be peppered with bullets, not because they're necessarily shooting at you, just because of you're in the, in the vicinity and Now your medic unit's being peppered, right? Because you're just in the vicinity. And you have no clue. But yet, you know, this kind of stuff doesn't doesn't happen here. That happens someplace else. That happens in LA, it happens in Chicago, not in Dundalk, not in Pikesville, not in Lutherville. It does. I mean, that's something like out of the old west that I'm sure the officers working that day probably never thought that they'd be involved in a gunfight like that. And no, that's not gonna happen to me. I'm not gonna roll up into something like that and, and get my rear end handed to me. 325, right? They're upstairs on a, on a call at 130 Slade. Guy comes upstairs and says, hey buddy, there's somebody downstairs tearing the daylights out of your medic unit. And they go downstairs and you know, this guy is inside just tearing the thing up and as, as they approach, he starts throwing needles out of the box at the provider. I mean, anything can happen and anything can go wrong when you're on a call. I have a close friend of mine, I wouldn't say a close friend, but a guy that I know uh, Paul Maniscalco, he's retired out of the New York City Fire Department, uh, was deputy chief in charge of EMS, um, teaches at Georgetown. Uh, we've done a lot of work together, wrote a chapter for his book. And during the city riots, uh, we were seeing information, in fact, one posting that, that comes vividly to mind. A person writes, kill anything in blue except the mailman, even the firemen, because they're friends of the cops, right? And we were back and forth in email messages, and this is what he wrote. They need to take their, because there was a lack of enthusiasm here in our response, whether it be the city or the county, um, they need to take their, we are the world, Whole Foods Jesus, head out of their rears and recognize that what we have been talking, researching, and teaching about for years has now exponentially com expanded with the threat magnified to the 10th order. Right? In other words, take it serious. And at least the plan that we had put into place years ago had us set up with task forces 
and each one of the task forces had police protection with it. They had nothing down there. They were flying by the seat of their pants. And how in the world they did not see the, the gun violence that was seen in L.A., I don't know. But they should consider themselves lucky because the gun violence that occurred during the riots in 92 in L.A. was unbelievable. And it wasn't seen down there. So a lot of things have changed over the years. Um, as I mentioned, paramedics uh, assigned to SWAT teams started seeing that around 1990. Um, periodicals that continually talk about terrorism and violence. Right? Uh, back in about 86, you started seeing this, ballistic protection for firefighters and EMTs. Um, and I've noted people around here that have worn body armor on a daily basis underneath, of their, underneath their uniforms, EMS providers, you know, on a daily basis. DC, um, they tried to solve their problems by going out and buying a tank. Um, this was as a result of a couple of their people being held hostage. Um, that sort of didn't work real well, so they get, wound up getting rid of it. Uh, one of the big changes that we, we did make, for those who have been around a while, these are the uniforms that we used to wear. Firefighters blue, sh blue shirts, officers white shirts, patch, badge, collar ornaments, always carried a pouch on your side that had scissors, forceps, hearse tool jaws, and all kind of other stuff that hung off your side, right? So what does a police officer wear? Badge, patch, collar ornaments, they got a bulge on their side. So you pull up or walk up to a person who's mentally off balance, their level of consciousness is altered to do drugs or alcohol, who are they going to see? Do they see red and white lights and not red and blue? Nope. They just see somebody in a uniform. So the aggression that was going to go to a police officer is now coming your way, and you've got no body armor, no gun, no taser, no pepper spray, only good intentions. Right? That doesn't mount up to much. So the thing we were able to do was to at least get a lot of our folks to start wearing golf shirts and things like that to reduce the image of looking like a police officer. But places like PG County, they still have patches that look like this. Now, do you think that anybody, even who does not have an alcohol level that's high, is going to be able to tell the difference between these two patches and, and be able to see this four-letter F word? No. So what we try to do is to get people to, to understand and use the element of surprise to their advantage. Do things that you would normally not do. And we're not going to go through it tonight, but it, like at cars. When you, when you walk up to a car, where to stop, where to look for things. Those of you who have been stopped by a police officer, raise your hand. Bunch of freaking criminals. <laughs> what you may not know... <laughs> What you may not know is that a good police officer has a process that he or she goes through as they walk up to your car. I mean, I'm not going to get heavily into it, but it's a place to stand, and you look for certain things in certain places. You, you reduce your, your profile, and, and you don't stand in front of car doors. You stop, you look, and then you announce yourself. All right? And, and a person doesn't expect us to be doing that. You know, same thing when you walk up to, to doors on houses. We'll get into that, of what to do and what to look for, right? So talk about houses. Residential instance. What kind of calls do we run on within residences, within buildings, that can cause us problems? Domestics, yeah. Shooting, stabbings, that goes without saying. Overdoses, right? Right, exactly. Almost anything, right? because do we always get 100% perfect information out of our dispatch center? I mean, I rely on it all the time. Not. Um, so, and, and an illustration. Where's Berkowitz? So him and I, years ago, I'm a new EMT, right? And, and I'm trying to think of, you know, we go out on a call, and it's for a child fall out of a tree, and I'm trying to think of, okay, how much blood am I going to see so that I don't puke, right? So I'm trying to think broken leg, broken arm. So we come rolling up, man on the, f the front sidewalk, and, and he's just screaming, going berserk, and uh, all this, and he points upstairs. We go run up to the second floor, and there's a, a guy lying in the bathroom, and I mean, there is blood everywhere. And I'm thinking to myself, man, 
this must have been an awfully high tree, <laughs> right? So, I mean, you're walking in, it's crunch, 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 there's stuff dripping from the ceilings, and a police officer shows up, and he says, where's the gun? Well, I'm confused. So I go running down the stairs, and I look at Mom and Dad, who are now sitting on the couch, and said, what is going on? And they look at me like, huh? Well, it turns out this 24-year-old guy, not a child, blew his brains out. He didn't fall out of a tree. So you can't rely on the information that you get from the dispatch center that it's great information, right? So arriving on the scene, there's a lot of calls that, that people know what we're going to do. You dial 911, say, I need help, and somebody's going to show up, lights and siren, right? We're going to pull up right in front of the house. Lights are going to be flashing, sirens winding down. They're going to grab all kinds of stuff under their arms, come running up the front sidewalk through the door. They're going to save somebody's life, right? That's what people expect. So you don't do that. Right? On a lot of calls, you can get into a neighborhood and think about shutting your lights and siren down a block or so beforehand. Right? Don't park directly in front of the residence. Park in front of the house next door. Right? So if I'm going to 425, just like if I was on the engine company, I'd come, come down, pull past 425, got to leave room for the ladder truck, and I'd get a three-sided view of the house. Right? Pull down there. Same thing. You're doing a size up. What do I see? Turn off your headlights. Remember, when you go walking in front of your headlights, you're a target. People shoot at these all the time. Black silhouette, light background. Why silhouette yourself by walking in front of the headlights? So this is out off of Old Court Road. Am I going to pull up to the house next door on Old Court Road and walk a quarter mile back to the person's driveway? No. But maybe what I can do is when I get back in there, turn the unit around so it's heading out. If I need to leave quick, I'm not putting it to reverse three times to try and back around and get out. Right? So, yeah, you might not be able to have all the advantages all the time, but think. Instead of walking up the front sidewalk directly, Approach the house at an angle. Again, people don't expect you to do that. Walk across this guy's freshly seeded grass. Be stealthy. You know, we get out, we slam the door shut, we got the volume up on the radio, your keys are, are you know, jangling, you're, you're talking about, you know, what's for dinner at the firehouse tonight, some knucklehead that's standing up in front of you teaching a class that you don't feel like being in, all this kind of stuff. Right? Do you need to turn, have the volume all the way up when you go to scream on the radio? Nope. Right? But what you don't want to do is change what's going on inside of the house. Right? You're trying to gather some information about what's going on inside of the house. And a police officer will, does this on virtually every call. Right? I don't want to change what's going on inside. One of the first things that come out of your mouths was domestic situations. If there are people inside that house and they're arguing back and forth, I don't want to change that. If they're still arguing when, then, when I get there, I've got a decision to make as to far as whether or not I'm going to get involved. Right? What can you hear? Do you hear them arguing back and forth? You don't want to go around playing peeping Tom, but as you walk past a window, use it to your advantage. Right? Is the place a, a shambles from a fight? Right. Do you see anything? You know, is somebody lying on the floor? Are there any high threat weapons visible? Right. I classify weapons in two categories, high threat and low threat, and I'll show you pictures of them in a second. Can I hear high threat weapons before they're being shot? If somebody's got a shotgun and they chamber around, is that a very distinctive sound? Yep. I get a pucker factor of about 15 when I hear that. So, yeah, you can hear those things, but I haven't changed what's going on inside, right? Signs of a struggle, right? That person lying on the floor, the coffee table's overturned, glass is broken, things along those lines. Can you do that? Can you do a primary survey from the front porch of somebody's house? Yeah, you can. If there are pe two people inside arguing back and forth, their airways are patent, aren't they? Right? They're exchanging air. Are they going to exsanguinate from any wounds in the very near future? Absolutely not. Probably not. Right? So, do I need to get involved? If they're arguing back and forth, do I need to roll my hand up into a little fist 
and, and knock on that door? No. At that point, get back to the medic unit, call for the police, back up to a safe intersection, let them come to you. Right? Don't get involved. So, positioning at the door. A lot of you may know that you don't stand in front of doors. A lot of you may not know that you don't stand in front of doors. We don't stand in front of doors. You don't just stand in front of the door and knock. You stand to the side of the door. All right. This was um, an incident. Uh, I was working part-time for Howard County Fire Department. Um, the uh, medic unit out of Elkridge, where I was working, uh, was dispatched in the middle of the night for an overdose patient. Right. So they arrive on the scene at Capitol Trailer Park down on Route 1, go up and knock on the door. An arrow was shot through the door at them. Right. The door was not open. Arrow was shot through the door. Luckily, they were standing to the side of the door and didn't get hit by the arrow. Now, a little bit more of what's going on. Um, they backed off, call for the police, barricade situation ensues with this knucklehead and sunlight comes up, I wind up on the scene at 7 o'clock in the morning for my shift and we take over around noontime. Negotiators are on the phone, this guy had taken a handful of ant abuse pills, he was also an alcoholic. And they hear the phone hit the floor, they hear crowing noises over the open line. So they get a plan together, right? Police say, okay, we're going to um, tear gas the place. We're going to then go ahead and do an entry and go in. You guys come in right behind us and go ahead and take care of this guy for his overdose problems. And I'm like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. So at that point in time, we weren't carrying breathing apparatus on the medic units, and they weren't going to supply us with one of their gas masks. So problem number one, right? I also did not want to be within the confines of the mobile home where he obviously had an archery set. So I asked them, rather nicely, hey, would you mind dragging him out the door and leaving him on the front lawn? Well, the good tactical officers, as they were, did exactly as I said. They grabbed him by the ankles and drug him out the door and down the steps with his head going like this. <laughs> so, so now he is awake and he's getting froggy. So we're trying to cut all of his clothes off of him, and why would I do that? Well, if you're butt naked, there's only one or two places that you can hide a weapon, right? And be forewarned, people do hide weapons in those places, right? And I'm not going to go any further, but documented, they have. This is they hide weapons in those places. So, cut all of his clothes off of him, and if we needed to transport him, figured that a lot of the gas, particulate matter, would be left behind. So, it winds up that God love him, police officer back here is trying to help, and at the back of my head is this loaded AR-15, right? which again caused a little bit of a pucker factor. So, we, and obviously I had a hell of a lot more hair then than I do now. <laughs> so we load this guy up and we're starting to head for St. Agnes. I've got a police officer in the back with me and five minutes into the transport, the two of us are fighting for possession of the side window because the amount of off-gassing from this guy is outrageous, right? The driver here, he's weaving back and forth across the lanes of traffic because the amount of gas coming through the wind up into the cab. Right? So, you know, a, a lesson number two, I guess, here is if you're going to take somebody for transport out of one of these situations and they've been tear gassed or something like that, squirt them off, right? Pepper sprayed, anything like that. Decon them a little bit and, you know, don't think that you're going to throw them into a helicopter because that ain't going to float either. All right. So, talk about, you know, not standing in front of doors. Which side of the door do you stand to? Does it matter? So you want, you want to be to the doorknob side of the door, right? The doorknob side of the door. The person should actually have to look out and around the door jam in order to see you. So if you're standing on the hinge side of the door, when they crack that door, that's what they see. 
right? It's called a fatal funnel, and it extends out down the hinge side. So you stand to the doorknob side of the door. Which one? Right? Inside door, outside door, right? Um, actually, a long slide. So that person doesn't need a lot in order to see you, right? This is the one I wanted. Doorknob side, the inside door. So here, though, you've got this outcropping. So probably what I do, knowing that the wind is there, tap on the door and back off and, and down the staircase. Right. Multi-story occupancies. Um, we have a number of them around here. How do you get into a lot of these apartment buildings that now have security doors without letting the person in the apartment know that you're there yet? Buzz everybody else. Domino's Pizza, right? Anything. Buzz everybody in the building except for the one you're going to. Last resort, buzz the apartment you're going to, right? But try to get into the staircase without letting the person inside the apartment know that you're there, right? Elevators. Just like on a fire call, know where the staircases are. Right? If I've got to leave quickly, I may, may not want to stand and wait for the elevator to show up with you know, the, the elderly lady that has the walker and I've got to you know, get her off the elevator before I get on. So you know, know where the staircases are. Um, can you lock the elevator out with you? All those kind of things you know, come to mind. Right? So be um, Station 15, come up with this idea years ago. Um, uh, some of the apartment buildings. What they would do, uh, they would go up to the door, knock on the door, and back off to the staircase that leads down and out, not the one that leads up, because uh, you get trapped. But they would come, out, come down here, and on a lot of them, they said that they could use this portion of the stairs to cover for themselves. Right. Moving within the entranceway uh, itself, getting through the door. A couple of points here. Have you ever, anybody ever gone to a house and the porch lights on, the interior doors open, and you've just knocked on the door and gone walking in? Come on. I've done it. I did it. Right? Dumb idea. How many of you have ever been dispatched to the wrong location? Yep. Right? And, and I mean, we had it not too long ago over here on um, one of the senior apartment buildings where we get sent to an apartment, we're knocking on the door, knocking on the door, and no answer. We finally get, you know, the people from downstairs from the office to come up and open the place up. Oh, we got the, got the wrong, right floor, wrong apartment. They transposed the numbers. Oh, it's on the other side of the, other side of the building, right? And that's what happened to the guys in PG County. They got inside the house and they got shot. Right? If you're going to go into, a, into an apartment, like a welfare check, right, and you go in there, you force entry and go in, it's almost like the tactical team. When they go through the door, it's police get down, police get down, police get down. Right? Same thing. You go through that door every couple of seconds. Fire department, are you okay? Fire department, are you okay? Fire department, are you okay? All through that house. That way there's no mistake of who you are and why you're there. And I'll tell you what, the guys in PG County that got shot, they aren't the only ones. It has happened numerous times. Guys outside of Atlanta, DeKalb County, they get sent on a diabetic, and they're trying to force entry into this duplex, right? They find a back window that's unlocked, so they open it up and, and go crawling through. 911 gets a phone call. Hey, there's somebody breaking into my house. They're coming through the window. Bang, bang, bang. The paramedics were on the wrong side of the duplex. The neighbor next door thought he was being burglarized and shot the paramedic in the stomach. Right? So when you go into somebody's house and you're doing something like that, continually announce yourself, who you are and why you're there. Right? Knock and announce yourself. Moving through the entranceway itself, Mentioned that a couple of times. Don't pause in the kill zone, right? I can sit in my living room, right? And, and you know, if I've got a, a weapon down alongside of the cushion in, in, my, uh, in my chair, I have very little thought process to just pull the thing and shoot if I hear somebody coming through the door because I know my house, right? 
So I don't want to be in that kill zone. I don't want to be in hallway. So you get through that front door as, as quickly as you can. Right? And you're not playing James Bond, right? But you get through the door, maybe open the door all the way back. I mean, it sounds stupid, somebody standing behind the door. It's happened. When I was in the city, it was happening to guys all the time. They would get called to a residence, they'd go inside, the door would slam behind them, they'd get the daylight speed out of them and toss back out the front door because people thought they were carrying meds that were useful, and they got the daylight speed out of them. Right? When you walk past the door, you look between the door and the door jam. I mean, it's, it's not a hard look, but, but you just, it's a glance. And you open the door all the way back. Again, you're not playing James Bond kicking the door open, but open it. Right? Close the door behind you. And this, for years, we've, we've thought about, of, is that a good idea, is it not? What are you doing when you close the door behind you? Blocking right, you're blocking your means of egress. You're cutting off your means of escape. However, in this day and age, you have people that, I'm one of them, somebody comes in, I close the door behind them, what do I do? I lock it. It's habit. Right? So if I need to get out quickly, now I'm fumbling with a lock. So if I close it myself, at least I know it's not locked. So that's, you know, you play with that as, as you will. Um, it's it's just, a, just a thought. How many times do you run on calls and you know, we have a medical box where you have four guys in turnout gear, you got two guys on an ambulance, BLS unit, you got an ALS unit showing up, a supervisor showing up with a clipboard, and, you know, you got all these people coming into the house at the same time, right? And you have something, you know, an overdose, you have, you know, something in the way of a domestic situation, something like that. Now it's calm, but all of a sudden this person inside is now saying, why are all these people here? And the, the level of anxiety goes up and you've got the potential for a fight. So it may be an idea at times, right, we're all intelligent, do we need all of these people in here all the time? Not necessarily. You know, have people stage outside for a couple of minutes until you see what you got. Okay. Moving through the structure itself, a couple of points here. Let the occupant lead the way. Right. Again, east side. They had the uh, medic unit go in, and the lady says, uh, he's on upstairs. Okay, so they start up the stairs, and their patient comes around and lays a shotgun down into the face of the lead paramedic. Now, his partner, not seeing what's going on, is like, come on, John, hurry up. And he's pushing him further and further up the staircase into the barrel of the gun. Right? So if I grab that lady who meets us at the door, ma'am, grab her by the collar and say, why don't you show us where he's at? And I put her in front of me. may catch some of the after effects of her head blowing by if that guy does pull the trigger, but it's going to happen to her first. You're using them as a shield. Right? And how many times have you been on a cardiac arrest and they say, oh, they're down the hallway here. And you go down the hallway and they're always in the last room at the end of the hallway. Same thing, the heaviest people are always on the third floor. So if you have that person show you where they're at, right? You're using them as a shield, you get there quicker, makes common sense. Certain situations, you get into the room, scan the room for weapons, right? Scan the room for weapons. What is in here that can cause me a problem? What's in this place here that could cause you harm? All right, what else? Scissors? Right. It's, it's hard to see. There's a steak knife here. The fork. Right? Golf clubs. Um, Vaz. Somebody big enough. Where's Vaz? He could probably do it. The entire coffee table. Boom. Right? So what are we going to do with these things? Well, secure those weapons if feasible. Right? If you can. Now, I talked about high threat weapons and low threat weapons, right? High threat weapons, guns and knives. Yes, even this big pig sticker is a high threat weapon in my book. So high threat weapons, anytime you see a high threat weapon, gun or a knife, you've got every right in the world to back off and call for the police. There is nothing that says on my patch that I've got to disarm people, right? Nothing at all. That's a police officer's job. 
High threat weapons, every right in the world to back off and call for the police. Low threat weapons, just about everything else in the world. Right? If I walk up to a BMW, right, and the person slumped over the steering wheel, and I see golf clubs in the back, oh my God, I could get hurt. Back off, call for the police. That's what the guy said. Nope. No, you can't do that. But it's an awareness that it's there. If I'm standing alongside the car, and the guy goes like this, and I saw the beer bottle lying back there, right? Again, being an intelligent person, my mind says, duck. It's an awareness that it's there, right? Same thing. And if you go out into Western Maryland, you go out into West Virginia, right? I can't always back off when I see a high threat weapon. If I come up on a motor vehicle accident, a fender bender, and I walk up on a pickup truck, and there's a shotgun rack in the, in the back window, am I going to back off every time? There'd be very few people in West Virginia that may get medical care if we did that. So, you know, you, you've got to couch things at, at times. But generally, high threat weapons, let the police deal with them. These things, it's an awareness that, that it's there. In, in the previous slide, right, with the coffee table, maybe if the person's sitting on the couch, I take the coffee table, slide it out of the way, right, out of their reach. The, the pair of scissors that are sitting there, sit my bag down on top of the pair of scissors. You never, however, take something and put it in your bag, right? We don't do that, right? Because then it becomes, it looks like you're trying to steal something as opposed to trying to keep yourself safe. All right, secure those weapons if feasible. All right, another little thing, pre-attack indicators. A lot of times, you can tell if someone is getting ready to attack you. All right? And these are some of the things that they'll do. Scanning. I'm there talking to somebody. I'm gathering information. Right? And, and you know, the husband of, of this lady who has a black eye, he's, he's agitated. And he's, he's, his eyes are moving back and forth and not paying attention as I'm asking him questions about you know, her, her current medical history. And he's looking around. Why? And scanning is the fact of they're, they're looking to see if there's anybody else around that's going to catch what he's going to do. Right? They might target a, a glance, looking at your crotch, if they're about ready to give you a knee to the crotch. Um, clenching their fists, clenching their teeth. All good indicators that that they're about ready to take aggressive action. I, their eyes are going to start blinking faster than what would be the norm. Fighting stance. You know, this person starts, you know, standing like this with knees bent, right, and they're rocking back and forth. You know, put all this stuff into context and start thinking that you're about ready to, you know, have your butt whipped. Flanking. They try to maneuver to the side and they're hesitating when you're asking them questions and they're not answering right away because they're thinking about the attack. Right. So again, you know, a lot of times people are going to tell you before they get ready to, to, to swing at you. So you come up on somebody that's, that's agitated, take it for what it is. You know, do you need to be there and put up with somebody who's aggressive and, and, and things like that? No. Back out, right? Hey, look, you know, know you're upset. We're going to run out and grab the stretcher. We'll be right back. Get out to the medic unit, call for the police, let them deal with it. Same thing, you know, somebody to stand there like this with a closed, closed response is in those situations, you know, it's another indicator that they're not happy. I mean, one of the things that I was involved in, uh, we were doing some, some work and an instructor come into the room and what I was doing and said, look, the students are, are thinking that you, what they're doing isn't working because of your, your posture and you're your closed off. And I was like, nah, that's just my norm. Right? And, but people notice, and you should notice, when, when people do, do something like that and you're dealing with them on an EMS call, notice it. You know, all these things, you start coming into, into your head that something's not right and maybe it's time that you leave, right? So we communicate a lot of this stuff. We leak out those moods, attitudes, and intentions. And, and if, you, if you're awake enough 
and your thinking, you can pick up on a lot of that. Their posture, their voice, stance, gestures, right? That all leaks out, and you can tell a lot of times, if you've been doing it for a while, you can tell whether or not somebody's about ready to attack you. Right? Again, if you walk into something and you think something's wrong, right? You get that gut feeling. It probably is. And the stuff that I've read, you know, our subconscious is seeing things that our conscious mind is not. Right? So, you know, for instance, you walk down a street and you get this, this shiver of you, as you walk past a dark alleyway that something's not right. Yeah, it probably isn't because your subconscious is, has detected something and it, and it hasn't come to your, your fore mind as yet. And, you know, take that gut reaction that something is wrong and, and you know, take it for what it is. Right? Listen to your gut. All right, domestics, all right? Run through these real quick. A real biggie. I mean, it, it sort of goes without saying, but you don't stand in front of, in between fighting parties, right? There was a, a member here in my younger years. We went out to a couple of clubs together, and we were down at a club on Route 40, and um, some guys had been drinking, and they get into a fight. And, and this individual gets in between the two of these big guys that were a lot bigger than he was, and he's trying to break the fight up. Dumb idea, because you know what? Both of them hit him, right? So you don't get in between fighting parties in trying to stop them. First rule, right? Johnny Gage here isn't going to win this fight. So use your voice. Use your posture, those kind of things to try and keep things down. Once they erupt, that is no place for me. Right? But you can try to keep things calm using your voice, your posture, all that kind of stuff, everything that you've learned, and you can keep things from escalating. And let me give you a, a quick story. Um, I was on Engine 1 one morning. We were out doing PT. Uh, the medic unit had gone out on a call down on Kenilworth Avenue, right? So a couple of minutes later, we get sent over there. Pull up, and there's a police car there. Medic crew comes out and, and says they've got a, a hold on this guy, psychiatric hold, and the guy says he's going to fight and he's not going to go. So, you know, we're calling in reinforcements. It's going to be a hell of a fight. Okay. So I go in, and I see a gentleman sitting on the couch. He's naked from the waist down. Okay, so first clue that something's wrong, right? So he's naked from the waist down. And, you know, I'm not going. You aren't going to get me to go. And I said, oh, okay, well, first off, what's your name? Mike. Well, Mike, my name's Dennis. And... Tactically, it may not have been a good idea, but I, I sat down and I said, Mike, tell me what's going on, man. And I talked to him. And talked to him for a little bit and finally got him to the point. I said, look, why don't you, I, I know you don't want to go. I wouldn't want to go, right? But prove your family wrong. Go down there. You know, you answer a couple questions. They say, you're fine. And you get in the cab and you come back home. No big deal, right? And he was like, all right. I mean, it took a little bit, but I talked him into going. No fight. So he says, can I ask a favor? Sure, Mike. What you need? Can I have a glass of water? I'm, I'm really thirsty. The paramedic stands up behind me and says, nope, can't have anything by mouth. Are you out of your mind? I'm not getting my ass kicked. If he wants a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, I'm going to give it to him at this point. Right? So, Think. Right? And even at that, he's not having surgery. <laughs> Might have brain surgery, but what the hell? So the speed of your voice, the tone of your voice, your vocabulary can make or break things a lot of time. There was a captain in Montgomery County when I was doing a class out there that made a really good observation. He said, Denny, 85% of our problems are of by the way we treat people. Hey, pal. Hey, sport. Hey, bub. 
And, I mean, if somebody was doing that to me, I'd probably, you know, get a case of the attitude as well. So, you know, watch how you present yourself. It's a business, right? You don't talk up to people. You don't talk down to people. It's business. Yeah, I don't feel like going out and picking grandma up five times a night, right? But you know what? I've been there at times when something good winds up out of it. And something bad as well can wind up out, out of, you know, having an attitude when you go to pick grandma up. You know, you get a family member that goes off the deep end just because you had a bad attitude, right? They're making a phone call, now EMS 5's down at your station, all that kind of stuff. Don't need it. So, you know, just those simple things can make or break a situation a lot of times. Just what I said. Hey, pal. Hey, sport. But, but you know, even even at that, you know, don't use big medical words on them. I mean, we have this tendency to do that sometimes. And, you know, that, you know, if you're dealing with the wrong people, you know, keep it on, on their level. Be professional, right? But, you know, I'm not better than you. I'm not lower than you. Just even keel, nice. You don't have to, you know, bend over and kiss somebody's rear end. But, you know, keep it professional, right? And, and ask them their name. You know, older people, you know, you, you wind up that, you know, ma'am, can I, what's your name? Ann Jennings, right? Can I, can I call you Ann or would you, would you rather like Miss Jennings? Right. Here's their name, right? And it, 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 it works a little bit better, right? Your posture as well can wind up causing you problems. And it's something about this, the way she's presenting herself is causing a problem. Not only him, right, folded arms and, and, and the look, but, you know, that as well, right? Watch the way you present yourself, right? Of course, that's not a problem. <laughs> and, and, and I had been with guys that would, you know, you'd, especially in Towson, you would have a lot of bars and, and things, nightclubs, and, and you'd get calls to these things, and guys would walk in the door and stand in the door, all right, what's going on? And it looks like you got a big red S on your shirt, you know, and it doesn't work well. Or you go into a bar and, you know, you tell the manager to turn the lights up and turn the music off. Yeah, really dumb idea at 1 o'clock on a Friday, you know. Bad idea. You get in, grab the person, get out the door, and, and hey, man, all that we want to do is get this guy out of your way so you can continue to party. And it, it works a lot better. Of course, now we took this shot in a state trooper's house. And he was, as he would say, he was securing his manhood because he had a pink chair. Um, <laughs> and we have a guy in an ACDC shirt sitting here with a Coors can and a JD bottle by his leg and a pink chair. We didn't think when we were trying to do that. All right, so we, we took what the FBI uses. They, they call it an interrogation stance. We called it an interview stance. When, when, we, when we deal with people, we have the tendency that we get up very close and personal, and at a certain point in time we have to, right, because you've got to take pulses and blood pressures. But when you initially get in someplace that you're unsure of, when you walk in, instead of getting real close to them, right, where they can kick or punch, right, stand an arm and a half distance away. Hi, how you doing? Right, don't put your body directly in front of them where they can hit things that hurt. Right? Your body's on a 45, you're off at a 45 degree angle, looks a lot better, and it's non-threatening. And it looks like that. Yet, if so that they push, shove, anything like that, that you can defend yourself. Right. It looks a lot better, works a lot better, than just stand there with your arms folded or something along those lines. Now, at one point, yeah, you do got to get in and you got to do your job. Agree. When you do do that, use a thing called contact and cover. One person goes down and does hands-on, the other person stands up in, in some situations and starts taking down patient information. And I'm on a street corner, right, in a, in a crowded area, let's say in Towson. The nightclubs are, are letting out. And I've got a drunk lying there with a knot on their head, right? One person's down making contact, the other person's up, and they're just taking down patient information, writing, and their head's on a swivel, watching what's going on around them, right? Is it time? You know, you're, you're kicking your partner saying, look, 
time for, we gotta go, right? We gotta get them on the stretcher, get out of here, this ain't the place, right? So that, that cover person is watching your back while you're taking care of the patient care stuff. Right? Another thing somewhat similar to this, and, and Dovey was on this, this call with me. Um, why don't you, in fact, I'm gonna use you. So we get called up around the corner here for, I think an unconscious person. So we're on 329. And this guy is, in fact, just lie on the floor here for a second. I was gonna try to have you get up on the table. But so, so we come walking up, guy turns out that he's drunk. So, you know, you can walk up and, and not be aware of, of what you might wanna do and, and the dangers that, that you could face, but instead come up from their blind side, right? where they can't see you, come up behind and, and get in a position that they're not gonna push you off balance. And when you, when you get close to them, what is in their hands? People kill with their hands, right? So where are their hands? What are they doing with their hands? And when I first get, got there, I controlled his hands and then the first place that I went was around his way, right? Because that's where predominantly, you can get them. You can get them. That's predominantly where a lot of people are gonna have some type of a weapon. Right? So, you know, just a couple of simple things. Thank you. Um, simple things like that to think about when you're walking up on somebody that's, that's lying on the ground. It turned out that the guy was drunk, didn't have a weapon, but you don't know. Use eye contact, especially in domestics, right? Try to get the individuals separated a little bit. You're not gonna grab them by the shoulders and turn them physically, but man, what happened? And, and you start maneuvering yourself and you try to get them spun back to back, get them separated. He's asking a lot of information. He can ask a lot of information, birth date, social security number, height, weight, does she smoke, all that kind of stuff. Do you need all that information? Absolutely not. But what it's doing is allowing that provider time to make the decision as far as whether or not she's gonna go to a medical facility or not, right? And you're trying to keep them separated. And in keeping them separated and turned back to back, right, you don't wanna place yourself in an unsound position. So when you, when you try to get them spun back to back, don't place yourself, yeah, now I can't get out of my primary means of egress because I, I've got this guy between me and the door. Right? When, you go into, when you go into a house, an apartment, anything like that, primary exit, secondary exit. Primary exit, the way you came in. Secondary exit could be a patio door, it could be a window. I mentioned about Montgomery County. Um, we were doing all the recruit classes out there for a number of years. And one of the recruits come back to me and said, you know what? He said, I was on a call and what you taught me because the guy came at me with a knife and I went out a second floor window on an awning. But I didn't get cut. And if you want to watch a videotape that will scare the daylights out of you, and I'm sure they can attest to it, Surviving Edge Weapon Attacks. It's on, on, um, on YouTube. It's like four parts. Does that scare the daylights out of you talking about knives? You bet. You will never look at a knife the, the, the same way again. Even something small. What lies close to the surface? Jugulars, all that, right? Do you need a six inch butcher knife in order to kill somebody? Absolutely not. What happened in 2001? Did they have a six inch butcher knife? Small box cutters, right? Maintain a line of sight with your partner if you can, right? Make sure that they're okay and watch again, watch what's going on around you. Right? You've got them spun back to back. You may very well see that, that they have a weapon on them. And in this case, you know, I'm not gonna yell gun. Yogi, how about if we run out and get the stretcher a wall? Okay, all right. Get on outside, call for the police and barriers to your advantage. He could very easily step over top of this thing and clock her. But it's, it's some bit of a barrier between the two people. 
right? Now, if things start escalating, again, if they start escalating that much, time to leave. Right? But he's got line of sight with his partner. Those two are separated. You're good to go. Right? I'm not going to hit on that. Never allow an occupant to leave the room in something like that. I need a cigarette. Oh, my God, we've got oxygen in the room. You'll blow the place to kingdom come. No, it's not going to happen. Do they know that? No. If they insist, go with them. If the situation deteriorates, no, I don't want you back here in this portion of my house. I, I, look, I, I understand, but I, I just have a couple more questions. Can you bear with me? No. I've got to go to the bedroom. Why? You know, a family member's lying here and they're sick, they're hurt. Why do you need to leave? Right? Something's not right. Your gut's probably telling you that something's not right. Act on it. Because that person comes back with a weapon of some type. You don't want to be caught to where you can't get out. And again, folks, it's happened. I've had the people in the class that it's happened to. If you do need to leave, call for law enforcement. Meet the police at a safe location. Please do not send some unsuspecting police officer into something that you just left. You do not make friends that way. Right? Bring them to you, and I guarantee you that police officer will wait for backup before they elect to enter into the house. Right. And document. I hate EMEDS reports. Despise them. That's why I won't write a medicine anymore. But in your documentation, feared for personal safety, call for law enforcement assistance, return to provide patient care after the scene was secure, and we were acting in self-defense and trying to leave the scene, right? And you already have an incident number, so you don't have to worry about that. Any questions about any of that? All right. Anybody need a break? Five minutes, anything? All right, we'll roll on and we can maybe get out of here. Cover, and it's, I mean, it still seems, doesn't seem germane to me that for fire and EMS personnel, you know, we should be talking about cover and concealment. But, you know, that's the world that I've been living in since about 1982. And, and that's, that's reality, right? Webster, New York, those guys, did, did they know what on their engine was going to stop a bullet? Don't know. They're dead. Right? But maybe that would wind up helping one of us one day. Obstacles that are difficult or impossible for bullets to penetrate. Outside. What things would provide you cover? Okay, tree. Exactly. I paid her to say that. It needs to be the right size tree. <laughs> right? So, Yogi here from station 15, he doesn't have much coverage. Former captain from Hazmat Unit Station 14, a little bit more coverage. <laughs> well, just the bald spot there is enough of a target. Right? Mailbox. Um, not many of these around, but it, 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 the point is that if there's something there, you can't stand in the middle of the street and go, damn, that dude's shooting at me, but what am I going to get behind? Because by that time, you're dead. So it's got to be a reaction. In the back of your mind, you have to have that in the back of your mind that should something go wrong, what, is, what can I use as cover for him, both inside and outside? He's got his legs spread so that meets the legs of the mailbox. Cars, right? Um, when I did the, the portion on, on vehicles, talk about, uh, we usually talk about motor vehicles. The, the motor block and the wheels will stop up to a 357 Magnum, rather large handgun round, right? Better than the sheet metal on a, on a door. So, motor block and wheels. What's the problem with the rear of the car. Gas tank, right? However, it's all the videotapes. There were tests that were done. And what you see on the TV, what you see in the movies, now I realize that everything on TV, especially in the news, is 100% true, right? Everything out of Hollywood is 100% true, all right? But gas tanks do not explode. They did tests, and they, they showed them on videotape that, you know, shooting into a gas tank, empty, Full, half full. Tracer rounds, small rounds, large rounds. The gas tanks did not blow up. However, I'm a really unlucky son of a gun. So, 
Where there's the back of a car, there's also the front of a car. If you can, get to the front of the car. Right? Now, this is out here in the parking lot. And the photograph was taken from up on this roof. Understand, Brian thought he was tucked in alongside of that car. The person with the angle, right, on high ground, has a different view of what you th might think they can see. Right? So the higher that person with the weapon is, right, they may in fact still have, still have a target in their sights. So you need to tuck inside real tight at times. Also, understand that bullets do not hit a hard surface and bounce off at the same angle. They will hit a hard surface, flatten out, and parallel that surface. And Mr. Whitman, from the Texas Tower incident, University of Texas, knew that. Right? Former Marine had a brain tumor, went up to the, the top of the observation tower in Texas uh, at the university and started shooting. Shot a number of people. Ambulances arrived on the scene. One ambulance crew, a couple of EMTs, bailed out and they get behind the ambulance. Problem was that they did not get behind the wheels. Whitman, knowing how rounds react, shot alongside of the ambulance. The rounds hit the ground, flattened out, traveled under the ambulance, and he shot both EMTs without seeing them. Right? So he used the wheels as cover. Fire hydrants. 30 odd six will barely mar the paint. Right? But it, it doesn't cover much. But when something happens, you react, you get down behind. You might catch around in an arm or a leg, but center body mass is covered. Right? Evaluate what's nearby and move to it if you have to. Curb. Uh, there was an incident down the east side many years ago, um, and a uh, suspect was holding a hostage on the, on the front lawn. One of the members from TAC made his way up alongside of a curb and was merely feet away, and the guy never saw him. And, and he was able to make his way rather close. Using walls as cover. Right? This was down at Quantico Marine Base during one of the tactical medicine schools. Um, team member is using the door jam as cover for himself. Paramedics are using the, the wall of the Quonset hut as cover for themselves. You have to understand a little bit about construction. Cinder block walls are very porous. A lot of rounds will go through cinder block walls. Heavy block walls, brick walls, more substantial, provide more in the way of cover. Right? At doorways, you've got a buildup of wood. Nowadays, it's metal. Um, but that will provide stability for the door, but it also provides cover. Over here, St. Charles at Old Court, I believe, the apartments. A guy committed suicide, used a shotgun, blew his brains out, and the pellets went through his head through the wall and into the, the head of a lady in the apartment next door. Okay. So drywall provides you nothing in the way of, in the way of cover. Right. Changing cover itself, you only want to move from one place to another if it's going to improve your safety. If you do, do need to look out in order to see where you're going to go, use a little bit. And I mean, it sounds like you're a kid, but don't run, if I'm standing here with a gun and I've got one of this EMT that's running straight away from me, it's just a larger target getting smaller, right? Real easy to take a shot. Move back and forth, right? Don't make it easy for somebody, right? As you get close to the ground, your level of mobility di diminishes because my old knees, it takes me a little bit longer to get up and start moving. The quick peek, if you need to move for some reason, Right? And only if you need to move, right? you look out. Do you want to look out from the same place right? two, three times? It, you become like a metronome. Okay, he's going to come out right about, boom, now. Yeah, he did. Right? So look out from someplace else the second time or the third time. Right? Cover. Uh, this was photos from L.A. during the riots. Um, your engine provides a certain amount of cover. Right? And a, at, in certain places, it doesn't. The motor for the windshield wiper, pretty good cover. Right? Stopped a number of rounds. Just above it, if the captain would have been sitting in the seat, he'd have been dead. 
notch on the promotional list for somebody to move up, right? Um, the McDonald's massacre in San Ysidro, California, just outside of San Diego years ago. Um, guys inside the McDonald's just opens fire. Somebody comes up to the firehouse up the street and says, hey, there's somebody laying out in the middle of the street down the street that's hurt. Didn't tell them that it was a shooting. They get on the engine, go down the street, and as they approach the McDonald's, boom, 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 they're taken on fire. So the two firefighters in the jump seats are now sucking up the cushions in the jump seats trying to, you know, make themselves small. And the one guy that I talked to, he said that a round come over top of his partner's head through the cab, went over top of his head, and hit the diamond plate motor cover, went through the diamond plate motor cover, struck the motor, exited the diamond plate motor cover and struck the roof, and dropped down into, the, into his hair. He was riding behind the driver, dropped down into his hair, and he told me, he says, I've got that round in a vial at home. That's how much power the rounds had, how much metal they could go through before it expended its energy, right? So, when, when you go on a school shooting, right, think of, for those of you who are, know the area around here, Pikesville Senior High, right, and you go down on that school shooting and, well, I'll stage out front. Is that a good idea? Think about, think about how powerful a lot of the rounds are. Even a 22 round can go, what, about a quarter mile, would you think? About a quarter mile is an effective range. When, when I was doing stuff with, with these guys and, and we would go down to um, Fort Meade for sniper competition, there were snipers that were taking, taking shots and having kills at one mile, right? So when you pull up a seven mile lane in Smith Avenue and think you're a sufficient distance, think again, right? Because the knucklehead inside of that school may still be able to see you through the, through the windows and can just open fire. Think Columbine, right? Concealment, protection from being seen, right? More readily available after dark. And what do we wear all the time when we're out on accident scenes? What do we wear when we go on a lot of these calls? Right, we, we wear that stuff. And when we were taking pictures for the, the book and, and for this, it wasn't planned. They were just had this guy from uh, from the station out and back in a bush, right? And they were getting ready to use a flash, try to, you know, reproduce this. Want to split his butt up, right? They snapped the picture real quick in a bush. Right? And, and we, we use that stuff as protection from a lot of times for, you know, traffic accidents. And it's, it's great. It's, it does well. Right? But just understand that at times that safety gear may not be the thing to have on. Right? Also, again, silhouetted. Understand that, you know, you might think that you've got some concealment because I've got this dark thing behind me, and depending upon where the shooter is, may not be. Not a lot of these around, but especially now, it used to be a one or two around here, but you can go two rows in, three rows down in a cornfield, and you're lucky if you can find your way out, much less anybody finding you. But cornfields, great concealment. Not going to stop a bullet. Right? You can rip the cornfield apart, but it's protection from being seen. Theory being, if they can't see you, they may not take aggressive action towards you. All right, armed patient. You can a lot of times tell whether or not somebody's carrying a gun. If you watch, you can tell if somebody's carrying a gun or not. First off, most people are right-handed. So, any weapons are generally going to be on this side of the body, so it limits where you've got to keep your eye on. Right front waistband, right, small of the back, any of these places on the right side between navel and hip. Small of the back can be uncomfortable at times, right? And the other big thing, bad guys don't use holsters, so don't look for a holster on a bad guy. Unusual clothing, right? You know, it's, it's spring out, it's summertime out, and the person has a trench coat on. Why? Jacket or pants sag, 
right? There's something heavy on, in that jacket pocket that when they turn, it forces the jacket out. Or you can see the, the pants sagging on one side. Good indication that they're carrying a weapon. You know, my keys don't make my pants sag. My wallet does not make my pants sag. The stuff that I do right now, we were sitting down um, in Seat Pleasant, down in PG County, and sitting in a parking lot, and um, myself and my partner are sitting there, and I see a kid come running through this parking lot with um, sweatpants on. And as he's running, he's got his hand like this as he's running. Now, I run every once in a while, and I never have to run and hold my keys or my phone as I'm running. Don't have to do it. And I'm going, Kevin, Kevin, he's got a gun. And 90% shot, wouldn't you say he's probably carrying a gun? Yeah. Right? And people that aren't used to carrying guns will continually check to see if, if it's still there. It hasn't slid down the pan, something like that. Right? So all signs that somebody might be carrying a weapon. Right? And, and something like this. You know, you see the barrel of the damn a little bit of an indicator. Right? Unnatural gait when they walk. Right? They've got something long stuffed down their pants. Hunchback stride. In, in that case, the kid with the, with the long gun and the trench coat. When he would walk, that coat, because of where the butt of the gun was, you would see the coat rise up in the back. Just a slight bulge in the back as he would, as he would walk. Right? Bulge or weapon outline, you know, visible weapon. Down below, you know, a waistline, something like that. And like this, palming. People that are doing something like that are carrying a small caliber handgun or they're carrying a knife. And again, don't dismiss knives. How many of you, right now, have a knife in their pocket? Right? And think to yourself, are you carrying that to cut open a mattress that's on fire? Or a chair that's on fire? Or are you carrying it for some other reason? And how many of you take notice of other folks when you're in the grocery store or something like that and you see a similar clip on that person's pants pocket? Do you? You should. It is real easy for you to have a, have a knife and have it in your hand where somebody's not going to see it and they're palming it like that. All right. So... For someone that, that you don't pick up, you're alongside of a car. You're over, over top of that guy in the, in the uh, parking lot that might be drunk. And they have a weapon on them. There's a number of things that they got to do in order to take a aggressive action towards you. Action cycle. They physically have to turn. If, you're, if you aren't directly in front of them, right, and I always use the, the example of, of being alongside of a car, and, and I always taught you would stop at the B column, right? A column from extrication class. A column is there at the windshield. B column behind the driver's door. C column all the way back. And you stop alongside of that B column and you're looking in. If they've got a gun, like the guy that I had, he had to physically turn in that seat. If I would have been back behind the B column and not alongside of the door, he would have had to physically turn in the seat. He would have had to visually locate me in a general area, focus on me, and then pull the trigger. Four-step process. That four-step process takes a little bit of time. And if you can interrupt that time, you've got a greater chance of survival. Right? So these things, shootings, and these are police statistics, shootings are, are very intimate ordeals. Right? Unlike what you saw there in Dundalk, that is highly unusual. Generally, the, the two parties are within five feet of each other. They're over in four seconds with only two to three rounds fired. Right? So they're very short, very intimate. So if I have the ability to impact one of these, I've got a higher chance of survival. Right? So when we started this, state police were teaching their folks 
that when they get up to the B column and somebody comes out with a, with a weapon, that Stetson, that funny little hat that they screw on every morning, they were taught that as they fall to the ground, they were to, the Stetson was to go into their field of vision, they were supposed to fall to the ground and fire back through the door, right? Because you interrupt that four-step process, right? You make them blink. And I can come up to anybody and I can go like that in, in their face and make them blink. I can tell them I'm going to do this and I can make them blink. So how can I do that? Well, back then, they issued dress hats to all the firefighters when you, with your Class A uniforms. Our first idea was have everybody wear their dress hats again. You know, so that went over like you know what in church and we got a lot of giggles. So then... Uh, very intelligent deputy chief says, carry your clipboard with you. Carry your computer with you under your arm. Something comes out of the window, crack. Well, I went, um, chief, suppose they're showing you their brand new shiny lighter and you clock them across the forehead with your clipboard. And now it's, you know, Smith Fire Department as opposed to Baltimore County. So we went to Vital Signs Pad. Right? We all carry them, write patient information down on, and if you toss that in their field of vision, they get a paper cut, oh well. A little bit easier to, to talk your way out of. But it does the same thing. It interrupts that four-step process. Now, when you throw that at them and they blink, your reaction shouldn't be, hmm, did it work? You should be slipping... <laughs> slipping and sliding in whatever is now running down your leg as you try to gain traction. Right? Richard's here. This guy comes up with a, with a weapon of some type and boom, right at his nose. Right? Now, when we did this, right, this thing we always taught, taught the guys that you should be within 10 feet of the vehicle uh, or within 15 feet your, your vehicle should be on about a 10 degree angle with the wheels turned to the left because it would provide you cover. And as even in training, when we did this, uh, the guy that was driving the medic unit, all of a sudden we hear beep, beep, beep. As Richard's trying to make his way back to the medic unit, the medic unit is now in reverse and his partner's now left him. Right? So it was hilarious. All right. So, next part. Right. We talked about the vital signs pad, you know, you, you toss that in their face and you, you get out of the way. It could be over top of a guardrail, down an embankment, behind a tree, anything. Right. But you just want to be out of that element. But suppose you get up on a motor vehicle crash and, and you're, you know, doing your DCAP BTLS stuff and all of a sudden you feel a bulge and it ain't proper, isn't it? Right. You feel this bulge in their waistband. Right. So remember I talked about first option. First option, let police deal with it. Right? Back away, got a patient has, that's, that's armed, let, you know, have the police expedite and let them disarm the person. Right? There are times that you know, you're right there, police are 20 minutes out, it's a Friday night, you know, and, and I'm right in on top of them, what am I going to do? Right? So a couple of points about that. First off, could it be a police officer that you're dealing with? How do I know? Does it make a difference? Yes and no. Right? I, I really wouldn't want to, you know, leave a police officer that was mo in a, you know, their POV and involved in a motor vehicle accident, want to leave them because they've got their weapon on. Right? But I don't know. Two questions you can ask. First off, we can go back to the point that I made earlier. Bad guys generally don't carry their guns in holsters. Right? So clue number one, you get up and the, the, the weapon's in a holster, okay, better odds. But I want to check and make sure that this person's legit. Two questions you can ask. Are you on the job? What agency are you with? Right? You don't come out and ask them, hey, are you a cop? Yeah. All right, not the question you want to ask. If, if you were involved in something, and, and they asked those questions. Would you understand what they were getting at? Absolutely. Every single police officer that we've posed that question to, they know exactly what you're trying to get to. Right? And, and it, around here, around D.C., you need a scorecard to keep track of which three-letter agencies operate in the area and, and, and all that. 
So, you know, what agency are you with? DEA, Bureau of Land Management, um, you know, ATF, Marshals, whatever. So at this point, you've got a decision to make, right? Do I feel comfortable enough treating this officer with their weapon on? Now, you could ask, can I secure your weapon for you? And I'm going to guarantee you the answer is going to be no. Right? Um, and in fact, we had a, I don't know if anybody here was with me. We went out on um, Valley Road right at the real hard curve uh, one day for a, a PI, for an, a rescue. And 313 was there. We pulled up. And the, the guy in the SUV really wasn't trapped but it happened to be a state trooper and he was injured. You would not believe the nonsense that we went through for, to have this weapon turned over to somebody. The, one of the people from the county, I believe, he wanted to just turn it over to the county, but it was too much paperwork. And they were on the phone and I heard the comment made, you mean to tell me that you can't even get somebody out of headquarters to come up here to Valley Road and take custody of this weapon? So it got to be a little bit of a mess. Um, but, you know, you're probably not going not gonna to get that. You're probably not going to secure the, that weapon. So, do you feel comfortable enough in still providing care? And, and that's an individual thing that you have to answer. I can't stand up here and answer that for you. Um, I probably would if I felt comfortable enough that they were real law enforcement, probably should have, a, um, have ID on them. Not every single police officer carries their gun in a holster. Um, the guy that I used to teach with, if we'd run out to the store or something, he wouldn't bother, you know, putting a holster on through his belt or something. He would just take the thing and stuff down the back of his pants, get in the car and run to the store. Right? So understand those things uh, those things happen. So, you know, Richard here, you know, they're in a position where, you know, we got to do something with this gun. You know, you could be out in Western Maryland. It's 30 minutes before the police get there. The only trooper on duty is coming from the other side of the county. And, you know, he's got this, oh, you know what, look on his face. And the first thing that he did took very good, strong pulses. Remember I told you, you can't hurt somebody if you, people, people kill with their hands, right? So if you control their hands, they can't do you a lot of bodily harm. So he's got a hold of this person's hands. And in your report, you do not write that you secured their hands. You took good, strong pulses, right? Good, strong pulses, bilaterally at the same time. So he calls his partner. Right. Hey, can you come up and check the pelvic area? Oh, I feel this bulge. Right. If you elect to take this thing and secure it, there was a, there was a lady by the name of Kate Dunneker that um, tried to dabble in this stuff years ago. She was a nurse. And she talked about the fact that um, a medic crew pulls up on the scene of, uh, what was it, stabbing. His arms that he, in his eyes, that he means them no bodily harm, right? The situation was the wife had fallen down onto the, the head of a knife, right? And you should be close, you shouldn't even be close enough to, to deal with that. But in this case, she also talked about the fact of, you know, when you take a weapon, take your shoelaces out and put your shoelaces through the trigger guard and lift the weapon that way. Or put a pencil down the barrel. No. You don't do that, right? If you're going to take possession of the weapon, and I would rather you not, but you grab it by the butt of the gun, and over the years, I've had a number of people in these classes, and one guy from D.C. says, Denny, I would just take it and throw it over in the weeds. Oh, dear Lord. A number of people who thought they were pretty good would say, I'd unload it you do not unload somebody else's weapon. Okay? You take it by the butt of the gun and you secure it. And where on your unit can you secure it? Right. Now, understand, when you do that, you are now part of the chain of custody and you are going to court. Okay? So again, 
another reason why you don't want to do that. So, if you do elect to do that, the circumstances just, you know, dictate, what was it? Handgun, knife, hydrogen bomb, where was it located? It had wood hand grips. Please do not put in your report that it was a TARS, PT-92 with a 15 round clip, that I, okay, because you want to keep it simple. It was black, it had wood hand grips, that's it. If you want to really get special, you can say it was a revolver because you know that it had the round thing in there that spun with four rounds in it or five rounds in it and they come out the end of the barrel. Or that there were like a lot of rounds that go into the handle of the thing. And it's called a pistol. That's about the extent of what I would do. All right, All right. a few more things. Um, Weapon locations, where do people hide guns? Glove box, center console, driver's right thigh. The guy that I had, the 357 Magnum, was down alongside of his right thigh because he knew that somebody coming to the driver's side would not see that gun alongside of his right thigh. And I didn't. Right? This was in a vehicle that was stopped by the police. Right? They arrested the operator, searched the vehicle a little bit, and lo and behold, where the speaker was supposed to be was a 9mm and two clips of ammunition. We were out, out one night with uh, U.S. Marshals. Um, they had picked up on a, on a wiretap uh, that a suspect from a uh, shooting of a police officer had been down in Prince George's County and was now coming up to Baltimore. Right? They were tracking his phone. And uh, I got a phone call at Station 1 to go out with them. So I, I meet the Marshals down at the courthouse downtown, and we start up the, J, uh, the JFX. They've got the uh, suspect sighted on Lock Raven Boulevard. We go by state. You light this guy up, right? Arrest him, all this kind of stuff. And they said, Denny, come here. This guy had what was called traps in the car. And he wound up, when they showed me this, you did something like you had to put the key in the ignition, turn it to on. Then you had to push the button for uh, the doors to unlock. And then the next thing you did was push for, it was like an anti-lock rear. And when you push the button for the passenger side window to go down, where the pa uh, passenger side airbag was supposed to be, electronically lifted up, and down along the firewall was a load of dope and weapons right, that you would never find unless you knew the combination of how to get that open. And are those still prevalent? Yep up and down 95 all the time. There was one I think that I saw that the whole back seat lifted up on a couple of pistons. Right. So people have ingenious places to hide stuff. Next time you go on a motor vehicle accident, the airbags don't deploy. The person may have taken the airbag out and you know, you're trying to do an extrication and alongside your left ear is you know, a handgun. Right. Don't reach inside of people's cars and shake them like I did. Real easy to grab a hold of you and now you become a hood ornament. Um, weapons themselves, a couple of things. 62% of pre-hospital providers have found weapons in that same study I was talking about earlier. Right. This was surprising. Of those people who were interviewed, 12% of the EMS providers would not report a weapon that they found. Are you out of your mind? This was from a motor vehicle accident. A person was transported to the hospital and they went through triage, went into the treatment area. They had also been through, you know, the, the medic unit process. And they got back into radiology and had films done. The films come back and lo and behold, the guy's got a gun in his pocket still. I had done, you know, a thing like this um, at one of the, the county used to do EMS conferences. And I did a thing on weapons for the EMS conference. And uh, a couple of weeks later, I hear of an incident that occurred up between Owings Mills and Reichertown, motor vehicle accident. The person was taken over to Northwest and the registrar took the guy's pants and uh, wanted to get his license and everything out and she took his pants and shook them. You, you don't stick your hands into, into pockets because of needles. Shook it and a handgun falls out and a load of dope into the ER at the hospital. And I, I went up to Reichertown and, and I talked to the young girl who was on the medic unit, I said, you know, I remember you from the class. What happened? 
well, I just didn't think that could happen to me. You know, I listened to what you were saying, but I just never thought it could happen to me. Clue, it did, right? So, you know, you, you, you've got more of an opportunity to search somebody than what a police officer does, right? Lumps, bumps, bruises, and deformities. Yeah, I'm checking for all that kind of stuff, but, you know, I'm also seeing if they've got anything on them that can hurt me. Um, Walla has a 25 caliber semi-automatic inside of it. Cigarette lighter, right? That fired a 22 caliber round, right? I'm just running through these. Ballpoint pen has a rod that comes out, locks into place. Cubaton has a small knife in it. That's a sawed-off shotgun, right? Not much bigger than the palm of your hand. If you pull the trigger, probably break your wrist. It's also going to do a lot of damage, right? Fires 22 caliber rounds. I'm trying to get the one specific one, right? There were a number of those, like that knife, that would make their way through metal detectors years ago. Not so much now, but they would make their way through the metal detectors at the airports years ago. Um, little four-shot revolver. Right? Has a necklace holder. Cat's claw, made out of a uh, coat hanger. Shave the, the end. That fires a 38 caliber round. How many of you would think that that could kill you? Well, it's just a little charm. Right. Twine knife. Um, cricket. This is a CO2 cartridge that has been expended. You put a little bit of black powder in it, put, put a piece of fuse down, right? a couple of nails for shrapnel. You light that thing and toss it at somebody, kaboom. It's a little hand grenade. Same thing, you can take firecrackers. M80s, large firecrackers. Dip them in glue, dip them in BBs. Now it becomes an antipersonnel weapon. Right? Um, still trying to get to this one. A number of meth labs years ago used to be um, booby trapped. One of the things they would use would be hand grenades in a soup can. This would be, the ring would be tied to a piece of, piece of fishing line, um, and then when you pull that, pulls the, the pin and it pulls the thing out of the, the can, you come through the door and boom. Tech 9. That is a 35 round clip. It's, it's semi-automatic, it's not fully automatic, but it recycles in .08 seconds. So Basically, as fast as you can fire it, as fast as the rounds are going to come out. And this is a new one that I saw just not too long ago. That thing is scary. That thing, will that do a lot of damage? Absolutely. Right? And it is very concealable. This one is what I was trying to get. We went out one night over at Towson, Charles Street Avenue, 2 o'clock in the morning, rescue. Car flipped over, two dudes in it. Right? Extricate them, get them out, and the one guy's acting froggy. Something's not right. Gut instinct. And they put him on a board, got him up in the back of Medic 1, and I went to one of the police officers and said, can you come here a second? Can you do me a favor and get up there and just do a quick search on him? When he did, that's what was in the guy's pocket. They would have taken this guy down to shock trauma. would have been real easy for him to pull that and cap the guy in the back of the medic unit. Right. And that was in Towson. How many of you, when you're treating somebody, female, put her purse on the, on the stretcher between their legs? We always did. Do you know what there is in a lady's purse that can do you damage? <laughs> Besides the credit cards. <laughs> Any number of things, right? Any number of things. Um, pepper spray, right? Do you damage? How many of you would think this to be anything other than a road flare? Right? This looks like a road flare. Looks like Kermantel, but it's deck cord. Right? You can, somebody who knows how to use it can use a deck cord and drop a tree. Right? Dangerous stuff. Blasting caps, dangerous stuff. Just be aware of, you know, you see things when you walk into an apartment, into a house, you know, is it somebody that's trying to make bomb stuff? That never happens around here. Booby traps. This was out in Ohio. Fire department was called for a structure fire. Uh, police advised them, do not approach the house until we get there. Once they got inside, below each windowsill was one of these strips embedded with razor blades. If these guys were to throw a ladder and gone through a window, tore their butts up. Right. Cell phone gun. Right? And, and that thing 
shoots four small caliber rounds. Good stuff. Right. So, the idea, right, identify potential threats, stay the heck away from them. Allow law enforcement to secure the scene, shooting and stabbings, sort of block away, wait for the police to secure the scene. There is a difference, right? Dundalk, police were there. Was that secure? Absolutely not. And you can do everything right, and you can still get hurt, right? So that's what I got. I thank you for coming by tonight. Um, sorry I get rather passionate about this stuff, but... Um, I hate to see folks get hurt, at least doing this stuff. Thank you. you bet. Stay, stay safe, guys. And anybody that's interested, I did do a novel. Um, it's called Medic Up, and it's a takeoff. If any of you had ever heard of the Palzinski incident from, from years ago down, down in Dundalk, everything happens in Dundalk. Um, <laughs> it's, a, it's a pretty good novel that I wrote a few years back. Um, so, and... In the novel, everything takes place in Towson. So thanks, folks. Have a good night. <laughs>